Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Chris Dockery, Vice President for Academic Vista and uh, Dean of the Faculty here at, at the college. It's a pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's program um, and to introduce Dr. David Contasta. David Contasta has been Professor of History at Chess Central College for many years. He is an author of over 25 books and more than 100 articles and reviews. Those books include several regional topics, such as Suburb in the City, Chess Central Philadelphia, and Metropolitan Paradise, Philadelphia's Wissahickon Valley. Other books by Contasta focus on national and international themes, Henry Adams and the American Experiment, Rebel Giants, The Revolutionary Lives of Abraham Lincoln and Charles Darwin, and America's Nameless Wars. At present, he is writing a book about the U.S. presidency entitled The Promise and Perils of the American Presidential Experiment, as well as the novel with the working title Happenstance. His most recent publication is An American Childhood, co-authored with Philip Hazelton and the subject of today's colloquium. And we're also pleased to welcome Jules Olszewski, who worked with um, uh, Dr. Contasta and Philip Hazelton on the illustrations in the, in the book. Contasta frequently gives talks to community groups and has written, co-produced, and appeared in several documentary films, in addition to doing numerous interviews on radio and television. He has also lectured at Nanjing University in China and Piantech University in South Korea. Contasta is a recipient of the Lindbach Award for Distinguished Teaching, and earlier he was a Fulbright Scholar to France and a visiting research professor at Cambridge University. Please join me in welcoming Dr. David Contasta. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chris, for that too generous introduction. And I'm really pleased to have Jules with us here. She really made the book sparkle. I don't think the book would have been nearly so appealing. And I was thinking about how we met. I went over to Bruno's one day, right, and ran into you there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you remember that? Yeah, um, I had been working there for a little bit. And I feel like we just kind of locked in a conversation almost immediately. I think you were reading something, um, a really thick book on... It was architectural design. Yeah. <laughs> or historical architecture of some sort. So uh, obviously I jumped right in and uh, I started talking and didn't really stop and here we are. And I showed him my work. Um, I'm a student at Tyler um, Temple University, um, art history, and we of course kicked it right off and were able mm -hmm. to talk about you know all of our interests and they really coalesced and turned into one, and I think it shows in, in this piece. Right, and it turned out that we had some common acquaintances in yeah. Pottstown, of all places. Not that I'm running down Pottstown, but I never would have thought there'd be some common acquaintances yeah. Yeah. there. You graduated from Plymouth White Marsh High School, right, just up the road? Yeah, I'm pretty local. Um, I grew up in Philadelphia, um, and the, the, the writings of this book kind of really um, resonated with me because it, it really felt as if I was also reading through my own childhood. Um, definitely different time periods, but... Definitely different time periods. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but yeah, no, so there is a hometown nature that I really was able to connect to while, while we were working okay. on this book. It was really fun. And you live in Lafayette Hill now, correct? Mm -hmm. So Still you could have walked here. Yeah, I really right. could have. I think we parked over at Bruno's, but don't tell them. Oh, don't tell them that. No, I won't. <laughs> All right, I'm going to begin with this photograph that you used for the cover. So perhaps you can talk about how you went from the photograph to the cover. Do you want to do that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this is the original photo. You can kind of see the similarities. Um, what we really wanted to focus on was this idea of a procession. Um, in this really important moment for the town, um, a, um, a, what would you call it? Uh, not a it was actually the sesquicentennial parade. Parade, yeah. And you want to talk about the trees? I'm gonna flip it to the mm -hmm. next one. Yeah, so we had this really great space in between in the photo where we wanted to um, put David and Philip and that's kind of where I inserted my own interpretation. We mm -hmm. even got down to their Boy Scout uniforms. Um, their faces are juxtaposed into the picture. Right. Um, 
the colors of the guard are David's high school colors, purple and tan. Um, we definitely wanted to get this kind of split um, composition of a really natural setting with the trees and then the authentic brick road. Um, we thought that that it's would not all, the yellow brick road. Though. No, it's yeah. definitely not, but close enough. Yeah. Um, it takes that much to get to where you are now. But um, yeah, we definitely wanted to kind of hone in on this really full and luscious um, depiction of your hometown. Um, there's smaller details on the back cover um, that we wanted to get into there that there's like a, um, a banner that says something like Jesus saves and right. it gets into the- There was the always a aspects. Jesus save banner on the parades, yes. Always. Yeah, um, we have different political groups and stuff in the back um, and we wanted to incorporate the American flag and, and the high school flag and really bring together all of these different imageries to kind of build this, in my opinion, really full and beautiful cover. Right. Um, and the colors were great. And it was really fun to kind of translate a black and white photo into what I really thought was living color in real life. And those trees are real. What shocked me in going back there over a week ago, those streets are denuded. They were tree-lined. I think they were probably elms, and it looks as if the parade's coming out of the forest, but in fact, there were trees all over the place. And she did use one of my school pictures for the kid on the left, and then one of Philip's school pictures for the other kid on the other side. And I thought I'd begin here with some mug shots of the two authors <laughs> in their childhood. And David on the left side, I think, is proud of his two front teeth, his two new front teeth that just came in. And Philip, the co-author on the right-hand side, looks quite mischievous. And he was. He and his brothers uh, were kind of rambunctious. And one of my aunts said, if they don't watch out, they're going to end up in reform school, which they didn't do. Philip, in fact, became a Presbyterian minister, but I think being kind of mischievous and rambunctious saved him from being a holier-than-thou, too pious clergyman. And that's about the right age difference between the two of us. We were four years apart. And I'm gonna read now, and then Jules is gonna talk about this illustration, right? And this is towards the beginning. Our town lay about a dozen miles south of the old U.S. Route 40, a ribbon of highway now largely replaced by Interstate 70, which linguists and historians alike have come to see as something of a fuzzy boundary between north and south, at least in cultural attitudes. Although we lived just a few miles south of this divide, our town was really at a transition point between the two sections, snuggling just below the first foothills of the Appalachian chain in a wide valley surrounded by a rim of low hills. We could hardly fail to see the difference between the deprivation south of town and the miles of gently rolling agricultural fields just to the north. Up there, farm kids raised farm-winning cattle and hogs for the 4-H, and many went off to college in satisfying careers. The choice between well-tended farms or rickety mountain shacks was a matter of which way our dads pointed the family car on a Sunday afternoon. But the idea that geography could go a long way to explain the differences between prosperous farmers and poor families down on the hills, rather than varying degrees of the work ethic, didn't seem to occur to most of the adults we know. Most of the adults said people were poor because they were lazy, and later on screamed about the welfare state and so forth. But I thought I would get into that by talking about a Sunday afternoon drive. Yeah, um, the really fun thing about this piece was kind of working around this idea of this split composition, um, the north and south, this rolling through hills. Um, it, it took me a minute to sit and think about how I would arrange this piece. Um, and then it just kind of came to me in a way that, you know, we have this upper section um, and you really can feel as if, even with the child leaning out the back of the car, the 1955 Chevy, um, you can really feel this movement from one locale to another. And I, I had a lot of fun showing those rolling hills that David wanted to get in there. Um, I really just had a lot of fun with this piece. Um, this was probably one of my favorites uh, that I was able to produce. On the corner of Main and Broad Street, there was a small square laid out by the town fathers a century and a half before. And it were trees, lawns, and dark green metal park benches. And by the way, I didn't need to 
learn the order of streets when I went there because we had chestnut, walnut, locust, spruce, and so forth. A lot of Pennsylvanians just went due west. An ornate Victorian fountain sat on one corner of the square, put up in the regime of Benjamin Harrison. It had been a trophy of civic pride for decades, proof that our townspeople had as much eye for beauty as people in the big city. To be honest, this fancy fountain seemed a little out of place in the middle of our otherwise plain downtown, since its fat, naked babies and half-dressed maiden pouring water from a jar atop the fountain seemed suspiciously foreign and a little naughty. Okay. Um, yeah, so we see the, um, the fountain in the bottom left corner of this piece. Um, I didn't want it to obscure too much of the town square. I wanted to get a good amount of proportionate detail involved. So you see the shopping areas, you see the cars parked, um, and just this couple in the center kind of reflecting and interacting with this really beautiful, if, if you ever get to see it, this really beautiful fountain. Um, and just this kind of homeliness of the town square, um, I think I really wanted to capture. Uh, there's, there's movement um, in the person riding the bike. It, it just really feels like a living atmosphere. Um, and that's what I wanted to accomplish here. Jules originally had the man wearing a beard, and I said, <laughs> nobody wore beards back then. <laughs> that was just out of the question. Yeah, that was fun to learn. Middle-class matrons wore one of their better dresses, complete with white gloves and hat. Half a century later, the bustle and hustle of downtown is a mere memory as shopping centers and big box retail stores on the outskirts of town undermined and then obliterated the old commercial zone. You want to talk about that? Yeah, no, this one, we um, just had this idea. There's a lot of recurring themes of motion, even if it's in the subtlest details um, in some of these illustrations um, in the same way that some of the women are cut off to insinuate mm -hmm. that there's more going on outside of the picture. There's a lot more busier of an atmosphere, but these moments are really important to these women and it's really like what it was about for them. And so I didn't put a lot of detail behind them in the storefront. You know, you can kind of assume or plug in what you would like to be in that store. Um, but for them, it was this kind of sisterhood and camaraderie ship that they'll find within each other um, in these moments of, of being out in their day-to-day -day routines, right. I think. And people could go to the downtown and be sure that they'd run into somebody they knew Absolutely. that was going to happen. And this is a sad part of the hometown. The African-American community, which was very small, did not belong to the middle class. And I heard a lot of stories about their situation. And this is a good example of extended memory, which we talk about in other places. Uh, rumors had it that local African-Americans had policed themselves for years by discouraging, quote, undesirable, unquote, members of their race, generally thought to originate from anywhere outside of town, from moving in and, quote, causing trouble, unquote. And when I heard these stories, I couldn't believe that it happened to be true. And then later, when I was doing a book and documentary about the town, I interviewed Mr. Kenneth Saunders, an elderly African-American man, and he confirmed that, in fact, was no rumor, that, indeed, that was true. Another sad story that I heard was that during our parents' childhoods, we heard that African-Americans could go to the municipal swimming pool just once a week, the day before they changed the water, which was also confirmed by an interview with Mr. Saunders. I learned many years later that this sort of segregation on separate days at swimming pools was common in many communities in the North, unless African Americans were banned altogether. Um, so this actually is the only piece in the entire book that is figureless. There are no figures. We sat long and hard um, thinking about how we wanted to depict this really stark reality. Um, and David describes it really vividly in his writing, and I figured, let's do something that's more symbolic. And so we included the sign that has the, the, the days of the week. Um, and we thought, what would be the most sensible, most tasteful way of, of expressing this really um, horrendous like reality that everyone was living through at this time? Um, and so we have the, the, the fence, we have the um, 
the rep like the pool that's still filled with water. It's still in season, um, but it's a very real reality that for a lot of people, the sign was the first thing that they would see and the first thing mm -hmm. that they would be warded or welcomed by. Um, and it mm -hmm. was it was really harrowing to include in here. And I thought that it was important that we include at least some sort of depiction of what was going on. It was not unusual to hear adults use the N word. It was uh, something that one didn't want to be proud of in retrospect. And there are other aspects about racial and ethnic divides. And there were no Asians in town. There were no Latinos in town. There were just a handful of African Americans in town. This is a happier picture, but it's not happy in some ways, too, as you'll see. We experience the physical, verbal, and psychological manifestations of any communist concerns in our town. One aspect of it was the fear of a sneak attack from communist bombers. The Ground Observer Corps, we understood, had been established to prevent such a catastrophe. We had a unit of this vigilant group in town with headquarters and a watchtower on one of the hills just north of the corporation limits. Into this facility went volunteers, including our own parents and neighbors, who signed up for four-hour stretches. Armed with binoculars and a slide window device that pictured the silhouettes of various aircraft, our dads and sometimes our moms occasionally took us along with them to scan the skies for enemy planes. The main target of these communist bombers, authorities said, was an air base just outside our capital. We did not realize at the time that neither the Soviets nor the Chinese were close enough to launch air attacks against our part of the world in that time before intercontinental ballistic missiles. It is not surprising that none of the ground observer volunteers sighted a single enemy aircraft. But I think this helps us to understand the coming of the Vietnam War and all the crazy hype about the dangers of communism. But I think this is one of my favorite pictures that you've done. Yeah, this was actually one of the first illustrations that I created. Um, I immediately had the idea in my head. Um, it really feels like a dual memory, in my opinion. Um, we have this excitement behind the children seeing these planes. You know, we have the daughter kind of pointing out in, in, this, in this bout of, like, imagination and excitement. Um, and, and the other child, for the children, they had this naive idea of what was really going on to them. It was just planes, and to the father, it was something a lot more real. It was something with a lot more context behind it. And even down to the face-to-face -face interaction between the father and the son, you know, he's probably looking at him with this idea of what is the future going to look like for him? Um, what has it looked like for me? And it's this kind of really, really nuanced depiction that I wanted to get in there um, in terms of how each group was interpreting it. And the dad's probably a World War II veteran, and that's why he volunteered. It may be that the anti-communist scare found fertile soil in our town and in America as a whole because we were more than ready to believe in dark conspiracies, or at least eager to believe that nothing was simple and on the surface. A noted source of such dark rumors was a downtown sporting goods store, a popular hangout for men and boys, operated by a longtime resident, Bud Heffernan. His place always looked cluttered and outdated with its false tin ceiling molded into rows of square indentations and displaying a Victorian floral design in the middle of each one. On the walls, we saw stuffed fish, deer antlers, and other long ago hunting trophies. And on racks, there were the hunting and sports magazines, along with Esquire and Playboy, which, of course, we never looked at, and other familiar publications of the day. Behind the counter, we eyed the racks of shiny new rifles and shotguns, along with boxes of shells in their red, green, or copper-colored casings. In the aisles, we surveyed the shelves of hunting boots and jackets, fishing tackle and cardboard cartons of gym suits and other sports gear, which he stocked at the request of the local high school. Even if we had gone in blindfold, the smells of Bud's store were unmistakable, a combination of heavy tobacco smoke, gun cleaning oil, and new football jerseys. We never spent more than a few minutes in Bud's place without hearing some retail businessman unleash a tale of local conspiracy. According to him, a manufacturer in town owned several judges and politicians to do their bidding, while the firm held a veto power over any community project. He also whispered knowingly that the high school football coach 
was about to be fired because certain men whom he called big shots wanted him out. Then there was a mediocre athlete who got into the starting lineup because his father had something on the high school principal. The hangers-on in the store nodded at these stories, knowing the truth of what was said. These whispers and nods played to a desire for unseen drama. They also allowed individuals to claim a degree of victimhood or to provide them with a simple explanation for confusing issues and complex problems. And any story that suggested that communist agents were manipulating us through government, the school, or even the pulpit fitted in with a larger conspiratorial view of the world. And of course, this goes on today. Uh, Americans love conspiracies. I think it's true all over the world. And sometimes these conspiracy stories are dangerous. Yeah, and I feel like um, another common theme throughout a lot of these illustrations is that um, some of the depictions can be really, really beautiful and ornate and showing something that might be a lot more comforting. Um, but under the surface level, there are a lot more things going on um, that you can read throughout the text. And I think that this one is really indicative of that in the way that this seems like any regular store that you would walk into. Um, it's, it's busy, there's a lot of stuff going on, they're selling sporting goods, but there's so much more going on behind the scenes when it comes to neighborhood ties and things where you know we see Bud uh, talking to someone leaning over the counter, you know, what could they be talking about? Are they talking about the conspiracies that we discussed in the reading? Um, there's men in the back left listening to a radio. Um, down in this left corner, he's reading those magazines that we mentioned. Um, it really is a hub of, of community, I think, and I really wanted to show that in this, in this illustration, for sure. It's one of my favorites. It was very busy. It was fun getting into the tiny little details. And then we're going to go to talk about front porches and neighborhood. Our ubiquitous front porches reinforce friendly feelings. Only later did we discover that, discover that our cheerful front porches were leftovers of the 19th century romantic belief that nature was a sort of friend and partner in creation. The porch was a way of pushing the house out into nature, not real nature, where the whole family could enjoy the out of doors and domestic comfort. When we were growing up, before anyone in our part of the country really thought about the luxury of air conditioners, the shade of a wide front porch was one of the best places to cool off. We spent many summer nights there talking to parents and catching lightning bugs or counting the cars as they drove by. Walking up and down the street, we could hear the low murmur of conversation punctuated with bursts of laughter as family and friends whiled away the warm hours before bedtime out on the porch. Our porches were a palpable contrast to a later suburban way of life where people enter their houses through a garage and spend their free time in the backyard or on the back patio, hidden away from neighbors in the passing traffic. Oh, you want to talk about that, though, don't you? Yeah, just real quick. Let me, let me flip it back. Um, this was really integral to depicting the social nature of the neighborhood, I think. We have um, people waving at each other. We have people greeting each other on their front porches, like David had said. Um, and we even wanted to get this idea that kids could kind of roam and run freely through these streets. There were rarely ever cars parked. It was kind of an open setting where you know you would hear car and everyone would get out of the street um if you were playing in it it was it was very open and um even down to this idea of this division between the trees and, and the houses i kind of have this stark shadow line through the center um and it's this idea of the trees kind of cooling and, and acting as an aid to the houses that are there as well as the porches um kind of a refuge within the neighborhoods i think right. And this is one of my favorites, too. In the barn-like older houses of our childhoods, the attic was a large, steeply pitched, high ceiling space that ran the whole length and width of the house. These attics were so big that we could use them as wintertime shooting galleries for BB guns, with old frame pictures of long-departed family members offering the most tempting targets. Actually, that's my cousin Rick. I didn't do that, <laughs> although I might have been egging him on. The attic was also a place where we sometimes felt in touch with earlier generations of the family, since it contained old furniture and clothes, as well as dusty trunks full of diplomas, books, old letters and postcards, and other odds and ends. There might even be a few items left behind by earlier owners of the house whose children, we imagine, had played in the same attic and had slept in our bedrooms below. 
We also sensed a, time, a kind of timelessness about the attic that was unmarked by the waves of contemporary furniture which had passed through the downstairs part of the house with each owner. Up in the attic on a rainy afternoon, we could feel connected in some mysterious way to everyone who'd lived in the house before we happened upon the scene. Yeah, no, this one was just fun. This one was very comical, I think. Um, and everyone can kind of, or a lot of people, I think, can relate to this kind of stuffy um, attic where we keep all of our memories. Um, and then kids go to kind of not really interpret it in the same way and have it as like a refuge for play. Um, and so I wanted to kind of have that translation of, of heritage in the walls and the boxes and things that have been there for a really long time and this new rambunctious kind of energy that the kids bring into it. Okay, I'm gonna go back to the neighborhood front porches just for a minute because there's something else I want to read. We also felt connected through everyday neighborhood sounds and there's um, a lot of reference to sounds here and sights. We awakened to the rhythm of chirping birds, the whir of the, whir of the milk truck as it made its way slowly down the street and to the clang of heavy glass milk bottles plunked down on the front porch. Summer afternoons came with the sound of yelling kids, barking dogs, and car tires as they rippled down the brick streets and bounced over a manhole cover, which plunked back into place with a dull metallic thud. Just before supper, we heard the high-pitched calls of moms trying to round up their broods for the evening meal. The most comforting sounds came on summer or early autumn nights as we lay in bed trying to fall asleep when we didn't have air conditioning, so the windows were open. Crickets sang outside the window, interrupted by the muffled tones of the town clock announcing each hour. From over on the west side, we heard the freight trains as they slid through town, blowing their mournful whistles at every crossing until the last barely audible sounds dissolved into the heavy night air. Yeah, and I just wanted to include um I, I definitely could have included more um, houses and porches, but I think I wanted to have this this split um, setting where we do have these trees that are really important to the to the entire space. I think um, you know you would probably, if you had your windows open without air conditioning, you would hear those trees rustling in the fall, mm -hmm. um, and even in the winter when those leaves would be gone. I think that. We, we talked about this idea that they would kind of liberate the house and you could see the house details and you could also get sunlight in that you wouldn't be getting during the summer. Um, and this idea of shading and not shading um, and this relationship between the built um, human surroundings. And people have forgotten nature. about that. They build houses on former cornfields. They don't bother to plant trees and so forth. Yeah. I'm going to skip through this one and this one. Um, this is in a chapter called The Family Web. Spouses have spent years trying to figure out the family network. We've tried explaining family trees and even pulled out old photo albums identifying all the main characters and how they're connected. However, we gave up hope long ago that they'd ever fit all the pieces together. So we'll start by saying that our family included more than a dozen cousins, plus parents, aunts, uncles, grandparents, great-grandparents, and in-laws on all sides. We spent holidays together, handed down tribal memories, and despite some failings, shared a genuine emotional cement. Um, this one, from an, a, a historical standpoint, I think was really fun to work with. I got to see a lot of David's actual family photos, um, and that's what uh, the majority of these uh, pictures actually are. Um, a lot of his aunts and uncles. I think his parents' wedding photo is in there. Um, the photo that I really liked the most was in the center of his mother. She's on a hill, um, and it's this really beautiful photo where the sky just like opens up behind her, and I really wanted to get that in there um, in a central position. Um, there's also a photograph of someone that you had known, correct, with the horse? Yes. Um, and I wanted to also have that to show kind of the difference between mm -hmm. transportation and just lifestyles in general. You know, you guys are probably looking back at these photos in a very different condition um, in your home and with cars and things like that. So we wanted to show this multidimensionality of David's history, I think. And part of the extended memory, which I'll talk about more in a moment, was that Philip and I knew people who were born in the horse and buggy days. They didn't have cars, they didn't have electric lights, they didn't have telephones. One of our neighbors was born in 1860. She died in 1963. 
She remembered when she was five years old, the church bells ringing in town when the Civil War came to an end. And so I had a sense of being connected to the Civil War. Philip and I thought we're probably the last generation who had connection with these people of the late 19th century who lived in what we would call a pre-modern world. And that they lived to the car age and flew in airplanes and saw people land on the moon and they must have been shocked. Through family stories, we gained an extended memory that went well before our entrances into the world. And I think these extended memories are so important to all of us because they give us a sense of connection, a sense of belonging, a sense of not just floating in our own generation or time period. We heard stories about grandparents and great-grandparents and even a neighbor who had died as a result of going through the graveyard with parents. It was during these curiously sweet moments that we learned of our maternal grandfather's hot temper. Now he had supposedly knocked a dentist down his office stairs for pulling out the wrong tooth. <laughs> a dubious story much embellished over the years. I don't think it was true, but it was one of those family stories. Yeah, this, that one was just, I wanted to really show this idea of like a, almost like a dreamscape. Um, it's, it's a little bit crowded, it's a little bit scrapey, um, and I think that that really plays into this idea of an extended memory, and then this kind of, it's, the cemetery was not a stark experience, it wasn't, it wasn't scary for no. most parts, it could be a source of celebration and memory, right. um, and kind of sharing these experiences with one another um, through your, your past history. I particularly liked going to cemeteries with my grandmother, because she had comments about everybody, including he was no good, and so on and so forth. Uh, the roles of our mothers and aunts were defined in many ways by their dates of birth. Coming into the world during the early decades of the 20th century, they belonged to a generation when very few women in our part of the country went to any kind of higher education. Thus, the division of labor was clear. Husbands were the family breadwinners and wives were the caretakers of children and home. In that sense, we grew up in a very real matriarchy. None of the women questioned this arrangement, at least openly. None of them would have thought it possible to have both a family and a professional career, as many of their daughters and still more of their granddaughters would insist on having. And that could be my mother and aunt, my mother probably peering into the refrigerator. And I'm imagining what they're talking about. And one of the things they might have been talking about was the dangers of television. When television came on the scene, some of our parents didn't know how to deal with it and worried about a possible hypnotic effect, effect of the new medium, a foreshadowing of later debates over other forms of electronic media. One aunt and uncle had no such fears. They were the first in our wider family to own a TV. And in fact, they were among the first households in town to buy a set. The screen was round and only about six inches across, though they could improve it with a piece of plastic, which when draped across the screen, magnified the picture a little. The reception was poor, black and white, of course. And the programming limited, with hours during the day when only a test pattern appeared. And if you don't know what that is, well, you'll have to look it up. <laughs> at first, we watched television with them as at the movies with the lights turned off and plenty of popcorn. It's interesting that people will take an earlier technology and apply it to a new one. Do you want to talk about this? Yeah, no, this is just going to kind of build off more on that theme of sisterhood between women um, that was probably really common um, through their, their everyday practices, their everyday routines. Uh, this was fun to kind of show David's actual childhood kitchen. Um, the fridge was also really cool to work with, uh, the detail that you could get into there of just a completely different technology um, than what we see today. Um, it was, the texture was one of my favorite things in this piece. Her, her textiles possibly made at home. Um, yeah, just this relationship between the two women. I only wanted to include the two of them because I wanted to establish this connection, I think. Because of time, I'm not going to quote here, but this is the family vacation, and the dad is exhausted, and the kids are carrying on in the back seat, but I won't quote that one, because we have to move on. And this is another one I won't 
talk about this is the mom having to put laundry up and it started to rain and the kids are out there jumping in mud puddles and driving her crazy. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about this one? Um, yeah, this one was also just kind of playful, uh, building into this idea of the naivety of children and, and them just exploring their own worlds and establishing their own worlds while there is a very real reality outside of that. Um, and the mother is just trying to get her work done. Right. And they're there. And the kids, aren't, the kids aren't cooperating. <laughs> yeah. Oh, she's trying to be cheerful, though, right? She's trying. She's trying. I think in the best way that you can. And I didn't really write about this. Um, and I'll let Jules talk about it. This proves that I was a good boy and did really go to church. <laughs> and um, I'm the kid on the far left in between the two rows. Go ahead. Yeah, this one, um, I had a lot of fun doing, I really enjoy doing portraiture, um, and I think I really got to hone in on that in this piece. Uh, we talk about this idea of me building almost a dialogue with each and every individual uh, child in this piece. Um, David could almost name uh, all of them, I feel like, and you can kind of discover something about each and every individual through the features in their face, the emotions that they're portraying. This was based off of an actual photo um, that David had, and I always want to kind of bring it back down to the two center children um, at the bottom row kind of talking and, and being caught in this photo where they're not strictly looking straight forward. They're living and they're existing right. in a really real moment um, that a lot of us could probably experience when taking photos right. as a child. Um, but each face was really fun to work with right. and get to know, I think. And I was behaving in that Cheryl Heaster who's talking to Donald Dunnington. <laughs> so yeah. I remember all these kids mm -hmm. very well. And this one was really fun. Remember that um, Philip was a Presbyterian minister and he wrote this part, which I think is very funny. We would have been wrong to think that pastors alone ran their churches. Much like the ancient emperors, emperors of Japan, they were only the outward manifestations of leadership. The real power in almost every Protestant church in those days seemed to rest in the firm hands of a few dedicated church ladies. They may or may not have headed a group in the congregation, such as the Women's Auxiliary or the Altar Guild. What mattered was their ability to alter congregational opinion through campaigns among the other women or direct confrontation. If a new pastor decided there would be two hymns instead of three, he would hear from the women. If he wanted to move the annual Thanksgiving dinner from the Sunday to the Wednesday night preceding it, he had better seek approval from the women or there would be no one to prepare the meal. And um, I asked Jules the other day if that seemed condescending, but I think that this is one thing that women at the time could do and have some influence in the world. Yeah, and I also think that I feel like we all probably know a group of people who have probably been in certain spaces longer than most of us, and, you know, they have their norms, they have their do's and don'ts, and I think that um, welcoming him as a newcomer for them would have definitely been an itinerary of things that he was allowed and not allowed to do. So this is kind of them giving that to him, and he's overwhelmed and in the center and <laughs> alone and trying to figure out this new space. Um, but they mean, they mean no harm. <laughs> okay. and, and this is, of course, Sunday school, and she has the flannel board up there. Um, I just quote a couple of things. Devices such as movies, film strips, and Miss Campbell's flannel board helped us to visualize Bible stories, but the best were the clever cartoons that some of the teachers used as illustrations. Still, such a failed when they tried to explain abstract teachings such as the Ten Commandments. One film strip's description of the famous Seventh Commandment, Thou shalt not commit adultery, was especially confusing. It showed two men walking down a dusty road holding hands with one woman. The next frame projected a large X on the entwined hands of the woman and one of the men, all of which left us with the impression that adultery meant adulthood, and that must be a pretty dull life. Okay. And each one of the chapters began with a child, and they're in ascending age. There's a baby in the first chapter, and then there's a girl who would be a high senior in high school at the end. That's my brother, who's in the uh, sixth chapter, and Jules used a, a school picture. 
We're, we're getting to the end, so don't despair. All of our elementary teachers were women, many of them unmarried. Several were sisters who had remained in their parents' homes and lived in modest comfort, like Miss Campbell at Sunday school. They seemed very much like nuns who had taken vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. Chastity in that they did not marry or presumably enjoy sexual lives of any kind. Poverty in that they received skimpy wages for a lifetime of commitment. And obedience in that they were true soldiers of a community social policy and carried out school board regulations without question. With rare exceptions, school teaching was one of the few professions open to them before the women's movement. Take it away. Yeah, um, so this one was really fun. These two women that are shown are actually people that we know. Um, and we wanted to kind of act, like have this piece in there as an homage to them mm -hmm. um, and a dedication because they really were these these selfless um, holy women. Um, and I think that I have Helen in this kind of orator stance where she has her hands out, she's welcoming, she's very comforting to these children. Um, and Gummy, she's holding her hands together like this uh, in, a, in a safe and, and again, comforting manner. Um, and I think in, in the portraiture of their two faces, I really wanted to get a detail where they, they almost seem similar. They almost seem like sisters. Uh, they could be one and the same. They're almost connected through the sweater, it feels like. Mm -hmm. um, and it was just this idea of familiarity and comfort, I think, that they brought that I wanted to depict. And they weren't, they weren't um, accosting the children. They weren't yelling at them. They're kind of maybe guiding them, maybe mm -hmm. telling them where to go if they're lost or something, or just catching up with the children. Um, I wanted to get that familiarity in there. And I'm not gonna talk about this. This is the school ground, and I was gonna talk about the principal and how he supposedly had an electric paddle that he would whip you with if you did something bad, which didn't exist. <laughs> but we won't go there, because uh, time is fleeting. We have many memories of the fear and distortion that affected our schools during those Cold War years. One was of regular air raid drills. At the sound of a bell, usually reserved for fire drills, we had to jump under our desks or run out into the hall and stand against the wall, depending on the civil defense strategy of the moment, to protect ourselves against a nuclear attack. As we stood there against the wall with our arms over our faces and heads cowering, or cowering under desks, wondering how such puny precautions could ever protect us from hydrogen bombs, the principal paced up and down the long hall, lecturing us on the evils of communism. Again, insert Vietnam there. Yeah, this piece is really just in the details, I think. I wanted to um, show this, this uh, excerpt in a really simple way through their small details. You know, we see the, the drill um, alarm in the top right corner. We see the list of what to do during a raid um, in the top left corner, um, we see the children kind of hiding and, and they are almost caricatured. The one's got his uh, hands over his ears. He's afraid, I think, and they're a bit concerned. Um, and this is where that, that naive and innocent nature of the children kind of really is brought back to them and they have to deal with it in really real life situations um, in school and just historically getting to know like the desks and I feel like we all know the sound of the radiators that are shown here, the clanging. And we still have them here at Chestnut Hill College. <laughs> yeah. The clanging and so forth. I like it that the kid has the fingers up over the edge of one of them. Yeah. And I'm not going to talk about this as a bonfire and pep rally and we don't <laughs> really have time. So I'm going to skip to this one. Our favorite movie time was Saturday afternoon when admissions for those under 14 was only 10 cents. And by the way, our parents let us walk to the movie theater, let us walk everywhere in town, let us roam in the woods miles away, something I never would let my kids do. By then, Hollywood was feeling the competition from television and fought back with special gimmicks. These included great Bible epics, quasi-religious blockbusters like Ben-Hur and The Robe, 3D, which required us to wear polarized glasses made of plastic and cardboard, wider screens known as Cinemascope, and a type of bingo called Screeno, which drew crowds who hoped to leave the theater entertained as well as a few dollars richer. Science fiction thrillers were also regular Saturday fair, like The Day the World Stood Still, 
invasion of the body snatchers, the thing, and war of the worlds. We knew from the beginning that even the U.S. Army was useless against the hideous creatures that stalked the stream. Once the beast appeared, the whole point of watching was to find out who or what would finally do it in. The favorite weapons against such monsters were microscopic bacteria, true love, or even God. As we walked home in the gathering darkness of a winter afternoon, we picked up sticks and pretended to be one of the characters in the movie just seen. We swaggered along, quoting the most bombastic lines of a movie. Watch out for those teeth, Commander. They're like giant swords. And ray gunning each other while wandering over backyards and brick sidewalks lined with huge sycamore trees, gorgeous sycamore trees. Um, this one, I also wanted to play with this kind of active viewing that children were probably, um, the role of acting, active viewing that the children were taking on at the time. You know, we have the child in the front leaning over the chair. Someone's probably disgusted with the results of the film or, or what's going on or scared. Um, and just this kind of forward propelling um, of each character, really viewing something that they could have possibly been viewing for the very first time. This innovation of 3D gla uh, goggles and, you know, there's no adults present in this view um, and we get this innocent kind of nature of children watching a movie. We, uh, we've all been there, I feel like. And here's the dreaded sex talk. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we had only each other to find out about the most burning subject of all, sex. Our parents, who told us little or nothing about the subject, probably trusted that somehow through the normal progression of things, we would find out on our own. The result was that our ignorance about sex was monumental. And I'm not gonna quote the next part because it's kind of X-rated. It is <laughs> some of the crazy stuff we believed. You'll have to read the book to find out. All right, but this goes along with the picture. When dad thought the right moment had come, he said, let's have a talk after dinner upstairs in your room. Sensing that something ominous and uncomfortable was coming, we mumbled our assent. Once upstairs amidst the clutter of model airplanes, high school pennants, and old comic books, Dad went through a form of speech failure and began stuttering out his dreaded lines. Uh, uh, um, mm, tell me, son, have you learned anything? I mean, are you aware of, uh, do they teach you anything at school, anything at all, uh, the facts, as it were, of life, uh, so to speak? the basics of um, the reproductive system. Thinking about the little bit of biology and general science we had learned, none of which had much to say about human reproduction, we sheepishly answered, well, sort of. Ah, good, that settles it then, said Dad. With great relief, back downstairs he went with light heart and even lighter conscience where he reassured Mom that he'd performed the dreadful duty to the satisfaction of us both. Okay. Yeah, I wanted to uh, play into this really closed off and uncomfortable uh, nature of this sort of talk. You know, we have this positioning where the son is is kind of brought into himself, and so is the father. He has this um, almost almost comforting, self-soothing um, stance of his hand on his knee, but also this assertive finger out. You know, maybe asking the question, maybe asserting what he needs to say. Uh, this really intense relationship between the two in this moment, um, I think was really important to play at, and even down to them being on the son's bed, this personal moment uh, that was really important to include, I think. And we learned more about sex here than dad had to tell us, of course. <laughs> When it came to the solitary date, access to a car was absolutely necessary. A car could take us to the drive-in movie, a boom industry during the generation after World War II. Known as the passion pits, the drive-ins were popular places for youngsters to do their hugging and kissing in supposed privacy as others watched the movie or did the same thing. Yeah, we, we see this definitely in, in this convertible. It was really important to include the idea of the convertible because we can see this uh, interaction between the man and the woman in the car and David and I talked about how long it probably took him to get to this point where he could have his arm around him uh, have his arm he just inched his arm over a little bit yeah it, it took until probably like three quarters of the movie to get there um, but yeah just this really fun moment of looking at the cars and it's in the cover of darkness where 
through mm -hmm. media, I think the mm -hmm. kids were really able to find themselves a little bit better than talking to their parents. And the movie on the screen is Beach Party with Annette Funicello and Frankie Avalon. I told Jules that we should do that, so she looked up the movie and was able to reproduce it there. Yeah, so we'll find a good clip to have. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that Philip and I talked about often, and I guess I should say that this book started when I went home to his parents' house. We had Thanksgiving dinner at his parents' house every year. And there were often 50 people there, the whole extended family, neighbors, church people, people who didn't have a place to go for Thanksgiving, foreign students, and it was just a, a wonderful experience. And one day we started talking about our childhood. I think that was probably about 35 years ago. And we started exchanging some letters and then emails and put it together for the family. And then about 18 months ago, I had an opportunity to, uh, to publish it, so here they are. But one of the things Philip and I remarked on was the, the friends, the neighbors, the aunts, the uncles, the parents, the coaches, the teachers, the people at the church who cared about us and helped us along the way. And another thing we remarked about is that there were neighbors who weren't related to us at all, but we called them aunt and uncle or grandma so-and-so, which was a wonderful sort of thing. So I think Hillary really was right. It does take a village to raise a child. Thanks very much. Thank you. And we have time for comments and questions, if you wish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, well, anything. You've been very patient. Just real quick, I did want to say that to that point that David had said about this idea of it takes a town or it takes a village to raise these kids, mm -hmm. I think inserting them, because they obviously were not in the actual photo, putting them right there and having this procession kind of come in behind them. Mm -hmm. They all come together as one big character. Um, and, and it is the town, it is the neighborhood. And I think that that's really integral. So I just wanted to insert that little part right there. No questions, no comments, no curiosities. Yes. Pardon me? Uh, we didn't say in book on purpose because we thought it might have resonance and I in fact I asked friends around here to read it and they said that it resonated with their childhood. It's Lancaster, Ohio by the way and it's uh, in this fulcrum between the north and the south about 40 percent of the town were from the upper south originally from Kentucky and Virginia and Maryland another 40 percent were directly across from Pennsylvania and it's named for Lancaster, Pennsylvania about 10 percent were the New Englanders including the Shermans. So there was a mixture. Mm -hmm. yep. yeah. uh, what is the question Yeah. Um, so can you talk a little bit about your style? Um, yeah. Am I right that there's a bit of a comedy book going on at the same time? Some of the, some of the drawings go very realistic. Mm -hmm. The one with the front porches, right? Very real. The others go almost complete, like uh, graphic novel. Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, I had a really long history. Like, I grew up with, with graphic novels and, and visual storytelling, I think. And um, I really like the idea that um, ink can kind of accomplish this dual style almost, where you can have really good texture in, um, in landscapes and then have a really nuanced and personalized uh, style through figural depictions. Um, and I think that, it, especially in my illustrative style, I have a, a somewhat different painting style because I, I do both. Um, it was boiled down also to the resources that we were using, what we were working with, um, kind of leaving certain things up to the imagination. And I think that that's where some of the um, more stylized examples come into play. Um, but it really was this kind of relationship and conversation between uh, resources that we had and what we wanted to build. And Because a lot of these pictures actually aren't from photos. They were things that we were kind of having a dialogue about and, and building from what David had written. And I think that that's kind of where...
that comes into play and is from. And I think it was better not using photographs for the most part. Yeah, definitely. We could play with the uh, composition a lot more right. through that. Yeah. Anything else? Okay. Going once. Going twice. Going twice. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. I, I can't see because the lights are hitting me in the eye. So raise your hand or jump up and down. Or something. <laughs> so how long would it take you to um, it really depended on kind of the, the detail. Sometimes I would bring something in and we would workshop it and, and create something else completely. Um, for some of the smaller pieces, it would really take me, if I sat down and really worked at it, it could take me probably about 45 minutes to an hour. Other pieces took a lot longer and took a lot more thought. Um, I really wanted to get a lot of detail into the portraiture. So if you look at the book, the portraits in the chapters, um, those took me a lot longer because I wanted to get down, like fine detail into who we were depicting. Um, but it really was just dependent. I could probably get these out pretty quickly. Um, just on the timeline of where we were working at it, it, yeah. it was really dependent, I think. We drank lots of coffee at Panera, didn't we? Had lots of coffee, yes. lots of tomato <laughs> soup. It was, That's right, it was fun. It was fun. Okay. Yeah. Is there something back? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so David talked with you just in passing and heard about all the different stories. And, uh, I just, just want to say how fascinating it is to see the way you guys are and how you complement each other so beautifully. Good teamwork. So thank you for bringing this. Yeah. And now I'm going to be part of this. And when is your next book? Yeah, right? <laughs> Well, I'm writing a novel, as some of you know, I think, and um, I'll probably have Jules do the cover for it, right? Mm -hmm. Not illustrations in between. And then I'm writing a book about the presidency. I've been hacking away at it for a couple of years. So we'll see. I have to wait till the January 6th committee gives its final report. But this was a really fun collaboration. I'm not an artist, and um, so it was wonderful to go back and forth between the image so then the text. And I think that it's beautiful writing. You guys obviously know David has a really good voice, but I think that because it was this, this almost novel sort of historical fiction in a way, um, writing, I think that having a visual aid to it honed in that idea of, of it could be anywhere. It could be an interpretation of all of our hometowns, I think. Um, and that was the most fun part, I think, establishing the almost yeah. cinematic perception of David's writing was really important to me. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Anything Thank else? You. Yes, Patrick. Um, yeah. One of the things that I noticed that was consistent throughout your work on this is you might have something very stylized, you know, um, uh, graphic novelish, but in the shadows, in the perfectly dark deep shadows, there was this movement towards almost pure realistic representation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I think um, I think I really like the stark contrast. I didn't want anything too wispy or too light, and I think that stark contrast really also helped me delineate in terms of composition too. It could build these these sections off, especially with like the trees, for example. Um, I think that it allowed me to have certain spaces of breath where you can take a break and look at this detail, and then take a break and look at another detail and almost work your way into this world, I think. And I, I, I believe that that's, that that's the intention behind that, to kind of have this busy, but also in some spaces, like not busy relationship and time. Right. Yes, Barbara. I'm struck by how gendered the spaces are. You know, so the sports shop male. Yeah. The women shopping, almost on their faces, it's their hats yeah. that you see walking down the street with their coats and all that. Absolutely. And then the kitchen, of course. But um, it, it was so interesting that you've given the gender world the mm -hmm. teacher for women. Yeah. Right. We, we had a, a lot of lengthy conversations about that because that was the, that was the reality at the time. And of course, obviously, we wouldn't depict that in today's world. But yeah. it, at that time, you know, women were reduced. I think there was a very early rough drawing that we had had where there was like a, a trunk and there would be textiles and, and fabrics okay. falling out of it. But like at that time, you know, for, for a really real 
existence, like women were reduced to those textiles. They were reduced to the hats. They didn't have those spaces where they could kind of come, some, some did, but there were those spaces where they were male only and, and right. there was that pride, I guess, behind that in those spaces, I think, that women weren't allotted for, for a long time. Um, and I think that's important to include for mm -hmm. the time period. Yeah. And Philip and I talked about the sexism in various yeah, parts. Uh, Nancy, Right, <laughs> they do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. We had a lot of conversations about that. David and Philip had a lot of conversations about it. It was all very deliberate, I think, in, in the relationship between the images. And, and I really text. do feel as if I grew up in a matriarchy because it was my grandmother, all these aunts, and my mother, and the fathers weren't around. They worked all day and then they came home and thought that they should relax while mom cooked dinner and put the kids to bed and everything else. So it was an odd experience in some ways. Yeah, Lakshmi. Well, she's definitely going to do a cover for my novel. I know that. Yeah. So. Um, we had a good time doing uh, the cover for David's Henry Adams work. Uh, that was really beautiful, this spread from front to back where it kind of built in this idea of um, Henry Adams' uh, ties to the United States and then his ties to Europe and stuff like that. So that was really fun, but like, like David said. It was my first book called Henry Adams and the American Experiment, and I reprinted it with a new introduction, and Jules did a wonderful cover for it. As you said, he went back and forth between the United States and Paris. And so in the front, she has all the American stuff. In the back, she has France and this wonderful Chartres Cathedral. It's just fantastic. And the Paris Expo of 1900. And one of the things I like best is that Henry hated cars, but he bought a 1905 Mercedes and had a chauffeur taking him around to all these cathedrals. And so there's a drawing of Henry and the driver in this open car in front of the Chartres Cathedral with goggles and the scarves flying behind them. Yeah. No, the, the really important thing about our process, I think, when we were establishing these pictures was it almost felt like a puzzle. We would list things that, uh, that David wanted to see in the, pe in the piece and then we would say, okay, how do we get all of those details incorporated into one thing? Um, and so the cover was a good example of that. Like a lot of these, uh, works that are throughout the book are that sort of process, this puzzled together um, notion of details, I think. Yeah. You mean this? The memoir? In our bookstore, no, but you can get it on Amazon and barnesandnoble.com and uh, Target. You can order it through them, and there are a lot of online booksellers. Sellers. I don't think we have it in our bookstore, and it's um, it's fifteen ninety five. <laughs> so. yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you, you so much again. Time. Thank you guys. Thank you for coming. Thank you. <laughs>